You know, I met Armin Kalikian in 1990 when I started my residency at Northwestern. And uh, those of you that were residents at Northwestern know there's sort of this aura that hangs over the hospital of, of Humpar Kalikian, Armin's dad. And people still talk about him all the time, back when, in 1990, and they still do now. You know, he just, he's one of those rare, legendary figures. And what I learned of him is that he was born in 1899 in a small town called Hajin in the Ottoman Empire, and he escaped to the United States with the Armenian Genocide and that, that diaspora. And he came here and he became a surgeon, and Armin will go through all that, you know, his life, but he was in the military as a lieutenant colonel, as I understand, and operated on many of the young GIs, and one including Senator Dole, who was likely going to have his arm amputated. And Armin's dad did seven surgeries on him and, and saved his arm. Um, the legend has it that at age 80, he was still doing 10 cases a week. And ultimately, he was a prolific author, and he wrote a book on Armenian poetry as well. So just one of those really sort of special, special people and mentors. And, and for Armin, I'm sure a very complicated relationship to have you know, the, the sacred relationship of your father-son, but then mentor-student. So I'm really excited just to have Armin share all of this with us. Thank you. start crying like I, I gave a talk at his hundredth birthday to our uh, alumni and uh, at that talk had a lot of stuff that I can't show now it's not politically correct he was a real character but it is I'm not gonna have any pers real personal stuff in there because it's it's off off kilter and I don't want to be disrespectful in any way to anybody in the room let alone my father so uh, this is a obituary in the JBJS in 1984 to Dr. Serafian who's like a second father to me He's in Spain now, he couldn't be here. He wrote this thing, and it's, if you really want to read it, just go back to JBJS, I think July of 84, uh, somewhere around there, uh, that he wrote this thing. And uh, you know, everyone's dad's the most important person or mother in their life. Uh, and I, I knew the guy when I was a teenager, but till I decided to go to medical school, because I got a low draft number from Vietnam, it was the main reason, I wanted to be a rock star, it didn't work out. Um, you know, I went to school. He never pressured me to go into the field, and I'm trying to do that now with my kids. I don't know if it's going to work. I mean, that would be my lifelong dream. I'd go to hell tomorrow for that. But the two years I was in practice with him were the most fun two years of my entire life, just being with the guy, and I got to know him a lot better. So uh, this is him. Uh, I'm a congenital orthopedic surgeon. Uh, everyone has a mentor. In, in, in China, they tell you that Everyone has a living mentor. They call him a Buddha, not the Buddha they pray to. Uh, my Jewish friends tell me that everyone has a friend that's older than them that's their rabbi, not their real rabbi, but just someone older that you respect. The things that he taught me, uh, which I'm still trying to learn, is try to be subtle, try to be humble, be energetic, and, and hard work makes a person. And if you don't work hard, you're not much of a person. And that, that was, that was uh, beaten into my brain from age two. Uh, this is a, a painting of Mount Ararat, which where Noah's Ark was uh, from, uh, if you believe in that stuff. And my dad, I believed him, I still believe him. He said all the animals got off, went all over the world, and the jackasses stayed behind. And that's where Armenians come from. And that's the town of Hudgen, which was uh, destroyed in 1916. Uh, and it was a genocide. That I, don't, I don't dislike Turkish people. I like Turkish food. I dislike their political leaders. They're, they're, they're fascist, but that's a different story. USA needs Turkey because of military bases, even though they do uh, uh, aid uh, ISIS. But, but I know that for a fact when I was there. You know, in the hospitals, they're taking care of ISIS sh soldiers. So that's a whole different animal. And our presidents are stuck with that, and there's nothing they can do about it. But uh, uh, now they're killing the Kurds who are helping the US against ISIS. So it's all screwed up, that part of the world. But. Uh, and I, I lectured there two years ago. I was invited there. My cousins are all pissed at me because why, why would you lecture them? But it's, it's an honor anyways, and my dad would have been happy about that. But he, uh, uh, the, uh, there's a famous quote uh, of Hitler's uh, when he wanted to go into Poland and exterminate a certain ethnic group. The general said, we can't do that. He goes, does anybody remember the Armenians? And that was only 20 years later. And the point is they don't or didn't. 
Uh, my grandfather was a, a cattle merchant. My grandmother, he got her pregnant when she was 16, but they were married. And uh, they had eight kids. And uh, where the hell is Armenia? Well, it's kind of, most of what you see of Turkey, that big thing there, uh, it, it was Armenia in 200 AD. It was the first Christian country in the world. And now it's this little country here, uh, surrounded by a lot of other countries. Georgia over here by the sea, we're landlocked. And we're also locked by uh, non-Christian countries that take it out on Christian countries. But that's the way it is, and it's always going to be like that. But blah, 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 I don't want to get into it. But Armenia was much bigger at one point. And uh, there's this movie that just came out uh, in April, uh, funded by an Armenian, $125 million. It's going to be on DVD next week. Uh, Christopher Bale's on it. It's a pretty good movie. I've never cried at a movie in my life, ever. And uh, I did cry at the end of this movie. It was pretty, pretty powerful, and it's the whole deal about the extermination of the Armenian race in Turkey. And he escaped to Syria, and now you know what's going on in Syria. Three of his sisters were burnt in a church in 1920. They went back. They said it was safe. It wasn't safe. Uh, my father came over as a quote-unquote seminarian to Chicago. He wasn't going to be a seminarian, but that's how he got over here. He waited on tables at the University of Chicago, and uh, that's him. And he came with $2 in a rug. It's not the rug, but I put it in there. And this is his cousin. He was in a, a slave line, a, a railroad line in uh, Turkey, and uh, my uncle, one of, his uncle, had a payoff, just like in the movie, one of the Turkish guards with, with a handful of gold to get him out of there. And that's how he got to Syria, and then he came over here at age 21, Ellis Island, the whole, whole deal, you know? Uh, he went to the University of Chicago, was a literature major. He's a real book nerd, loved to read and write, and uh, got his uh, BS in about 1923, all scholarship, University of Chicago. Rush, this was Rush Medical School, where he graduated from in 1924. Uh, it's a lot bigger than that now. And uh, he became a, uh, he's got his MD degree uh, after that, I think 1924. Now, he was at St. Joseph's Hospital, which uh, two of my ex-residents sitting right there, Dr. Gulik and Nam are there, and this is him with the bow tie, uh, and they're, they're pranking around. He did his residency there. I don't think they have one anymore. It's more with the U of I. And then he, he, he uh, had a tutelage under John B. Murphy, who's probably the most, one of the most famous surgeons ever, the Murphy Auditorium, American College of Surgeons on Erie Street and State. Uh, Philip Crusher was the assistant my dad worked with. And, uh, you know, he practiced cutting woods. He worked with Leonardo Taft in sculpturing to make extra money. And he was under apprenticeship of these two hotshots. This was the first orthopedic surgeon, I think, in this country. Uh, I believe it was John B. Murphy. I gotta watch what I say because Dr. Milgram will get me on the history. But uh, American College of Surgeons, 1934. And I remember the academy came right about that time too. And then this was Wesley Hospital, which now is Prentice. I was born there, my sisters were all born there. Uh, and he was uh, associate professor in 1940 there. Uh, then World War II came along and he was a Lieutenant Colonel at the 297th Hospital. I don't know who the blonde is, I, she's not my mom. But he wasn't married to her then, so it doesn't matter. And uh, he was decorated by Harry Truman, even by Queen Elizabeth. And I don't know who this guy is. I think it's Winston Churchill, I'm pretty sure, with him at that point. And, and, and back then, they had a lot of war wounds. He got to do a lot of flaps. He was still a general surgeon, but he did a lot of flaps and creative stuff uh, with limbs uh, in the World War II experience. And uh, he did this. This is all his cases. I get the photographs. That wasn't from World War II, but these are his drawings pedicle flaps, because he was still a surgeon. And back then, orthopedic surgeons did all their skin stuff uh, you know, on their own. This is my uncle, who I was named after. And uh, I had a different name. It was Saragon. And he came to the US in 41. My dad said, come to this country. He goes to Italy in a war, dies in a bombing. And after about six months, I guess my, they changed my name on a birth certificate, because my dad couldn't stand uh, uh, hearing his uh, name anymore. So uh, Academy in 47. And this is uh, Bob Dole as a soldier. He wanted to be a doctor or a baseball player, I forgot what it was. And his arm got blown off with a bomb. He had a brachial plexus injury in his right arm. And my dad told him, uh, he came to see my dad uh, in 47. He had seven operations. My dad told him to go to law school and be a politician because he's a war hero. And he listened to him. He listened to the guy so much. This is uh, 
uh, day of your life or something to give awards to him. My dad was there. These are his notes about all the surgeries he did on Bob Dole. That he was infected, he was, you know, all this stuff before all this. This is Dole in a hospital bed in uh, Italy. And this is his rehab. I guess my dad, he was a sports doctor, I guess. He was a White Sox team doctor in the 30s. So he, he personally supervised his rehab after seven operations. And, and this is uh, a quote that he gave in Congress. He was trying to pass an anti-genocide bill, but that's never gonna happen. And he was basically saying, you know, we always talk about the half glass of water full or empty, and he was more about it being full. And uh, he told him not to lament about what he lost and just get over it and move on. And uh, Dole was pretty big in uh, anti-genocide in general, especially he was pro the uh, uh, pro-Muslim about the Muslims that were getting killed in uh, 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 Serbia, and uh, he uh, was anti-Uganda. Uh, uh, what's his name? I forgot the guy's name. I mean, and he brought up the Hitler stuff, and Dole took it personally in his career to block aid to countries that are doing genocide. Right now, he would block. He would block aid uh, to any aid, to Syria or something like that. But he was really, because Dole was fighting for our country in World War II because of uh, a genocide. And uh, he, my dad told him this stuff and he took it seriously and he was a personal leader for it. He ran against Clinton and he was a hatchet man for the Republican Party with uh, Jerry Ford. And he, I think he only lost by 100,000 votes. I could have been Surgeon General, but who wants that job? But he lost. And then he goes on Saturday Night Live, and everybody loves the guy. He's funnier than hell. Uh, he's got a place in the Watergate, and Monica Lewinsky was the, his next door neighbor. And he said, I should have bought her condo because I would have called it Monicaville, and you know, like Dolly Partonville, and I would have made a lot of money off of it. Great guy. He bought every woman he dated, seriously, to our house to have shish kebab to see what my father thought of him. That's how close they were. And he said, Elizabeth Dahl's good, take her. Now, that's in 96, that's my mom and my oldest daughter at age six or eight, something like that. And he didn't win that election, but he's, he's, it was my medical school graduation, my both parents' funerals and all that. And he's still alive, his brain's good, his knees are shot uh, and so forth. And this tree he planted in Armenia by the Genocide Museum. Uh, I was just there last October, I took a picture of the tree. It doesn't grow much because it's kind of arid there, but uh, that's a little inscription of uh, Bob Dole's. Now, he became one of the founding members of the American Foot and Ankle Society in 69 uh, with Joust and those guys, uh, Jim Milgram's father. And uh, he wasn't a real political guy. He didn't run for office and all that garbage and so forth. And, and he did general orthopedics. Uh, this is a famous paper about uh, a ruptured uh, quadriceps tendon and using a, uh, uh, a semitendinosis, I believe, to do a graft. Now you use allograft and stuff like that. Uh, the, before total hips were out, in the, these are in the 50s. Uh, they did fusions for knees. Uh, they did a lot of cup arthroplasties in the 50s. They failed, and then they had to fuse those. I, I put those green things because it's not politically correct, you know, to show those body parts. Uh, this is a famous line of his, a rheumatologist, they're romantic lovers of joints. They talk about it, they think about it, they fantasize about it, but they've never seen the inside of one. And uh, that's the inside of a joint in the 50s. Uh, this really got to him, and, and you gotta understand, when a, when a person came over to this country, it was a pretty Anglo-Saxon country, you know, all the American Indians were killed off and all that. And this is him and Campbell's in 1984. A lot of references. This is his stupid son, one reference. Uh, there's his books, he's got three of them. And uh, his thing, he beat this in my head as a, uh, when I was in medical school. Publisher perish, publisher perish, help me write this book. I go, I don't wanna help you write a book, it's stupid. He was right, I helped him. Uh, actually, he passed away while that book was being written, so I finished it up, and uh, he was really proud of the fact that here he is, and uh, 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 he's got, what, 12, 15 publications in uh, Campbell's, which is the Bible, and he looks at the Anglo-Saxons, uh, Dennis, don't take this personally, I know you're Irish, so it's okay. But you know, he got off on that, because he said when he was a young guy at USC, they just they treated him pretty crappy, most of the people in college, but whatever. 1965, he published this book, which has 120 different bunion operations on it. This, this is older than the Rolling Stones. Well, 1965, it's 52 years old. I still have a couple of copies uh, that are covered with plastic, and it's a, it's a great reference book. Uh, 
but every operation that he kind of invented, it had to have a sexual connotation. So syndactyly isn't used much. I just did one last week for a real floppy toe. You take the bones out and you web the toes. It's called a duck operation. And I go, how'd you think of that? He points to my mother's breast and he goes, two things dangle less when they dangle together. Then he pointed to me below the waist. So I got it, I understood what he meant. And then uh, this is a peg and hole metatarsal osteotomy. You notice the peg is uh, the shape, uh, has a convexity to it, and then the hole has a, got a concavity to it. Everything had to have a sexual connotation. But you remember that stuff. He, uh, most foot surgeons did hand surgery before flaps came around, so he wrote this book in 74. It took him 10 years. Of course, I've got the copy where he cut out the uh, JBJS review that said it was amazing. And he spent 10 years on this book. He took care of a lot of kids with thalidomide, which is an anti-nausea pill used during uh, pregnancy, and these kids were born with terminal amputations. Uh, I tried, I did a couple of these. He taught me how to do it. I don't do hand surgery anymore, but a polycization, you take the index finger, rotate around a vessel, leave one vessel with the index finger, uh, with the third finger, uh, and rotate it and do a, a, a radio club hand correction all in one sitting. And it's kind of, that's a tough operation. You just you, when you want to see that, uh, when the turning is down, you want to see that thumb, but he's showing the function here, you know, holding a baseball bat or something afterwards. He did a lot of this kind of creative surgery. These terminal uh, agenesis from thalidomide, he just deepened it to make it a cleft hand so they could write. So he was all about function. This was a funny one. People would get radio ulnar synostosis, and Zimmer had this product out that he made, and it's a swivel. You'd, it's an intermediary rod, you'd lock it in place, and you'd resect the synos, you'd re you put it in the, uh, the radius so they could rotate. So you have to be able to kiss yourself and you have to be able to wipe yourself. So you have to have a hand that can pronate or supinate, or at least one supinate and one pronate. And I go, how'd you think of that? He goes, well, I was taking a dump one day and I went for the toilet paper roll. And I realized a swivel in there and that's how I thought of this procedure. I did about three of those in practice. It wasn't a real fun operation. Uh, it, it worked for a while, but it was kind of cool. Uh, syndactyly, this is how they distracted him, skin grafted, all that stuff for the hand and stuff like that. Then he was writing this book. I, I, as a resident, because I got done in 81, I would, uh, anytime I saw an ankle fracture in the ER, I had to put dye in it to see where the dye was going. So I did all this stuff you couldn't get away with now. Anytime you saw a good x-ray of someone else's, he'd get it copied, put the copy back in the chart, and take the originals back home for the book. You can't do that anymore either. You know, his HIPAA and all that, but he did it. And uh, I, I helped finish this. He did most of it. It came out after he passed away. And he had, you know, things about the vascular relationships, doll grafts. This is a machine he kept in a cast room, uh, you know, pins and plaster. You distract out your pylon fracture. He wouldn't operate on back in the 70s, the first two weeks either, because of this. And then uh, put pins and plaster with this dual repressor in the cast room under local. It was kind of, you know, pulp fiction kind of thing. Now, the Jude brothers were pretty close with them, you know, the Jude uh, hips, prosthesis, the Jude views for the pelvic, uh, the French guys here, I think there are three brothers. Uh, their sons have carried that on. They've invented the total ankle. I use these are the compeers uh, that uh, ran the department back then, and there he is in the middle. Uh, so some of his quotes, uh, be humble, and I, I, he always would tell me it's not nicotine stains on your underwear. I mean, it's, it's shit. You know, everyone has it. No one's clean. Uh, hard work is better than intelligence. People are really smart, are scary. Do not discriminate. He wouldn't even discriminate against Turkish people, and he had every reason to, but he didn't. And he would just push on. He, he was not a Tom Petty fan. Tom Petty wasn't playing when that quote came out. He always told me, don't back down. So that's my favorite song of Tom Petty's because of that. This is in front of our house. That's me, the little guy there. There's uh, Serafian, Tapujan, and... Uh, uh, Demanian's father, heart surgeon, and uh, Tajan. I think Tajan's uh, back there. And these were guys he helped come over to this country and get into residencies. There was a lot of graft back then. Some people say there was graft when I got in, but there wasn't. And these are these guys years later. And then they had a testimonial dinner for him in 1973 at Northwestern because they figured he's going to retire. He's 74 years old. So he had all his boys there. That's Tajan, uh, Goshgarian, uh, Tapujan, and Serafian. And uh, he became emeritus, he didn't retire, because I was going to medical school, and he wasn't gonna retire. People ask me when I'm gonna retire in five, six years, I go, I don't know, it might be 15, it depends on what my kids do, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Then he's written up in People Magazine, he wasn't on the cover, but 1979, he's 80 years old, 
He's still operating eight to 10 cases a week, uh, still working, and uh, so forth. And so I, you know, younger guys would ask him, when are you gonna retire? He'd take his hand, put it in their face. It wouldn't shake, and he'd, he'd say the F word to him at that point, like, look, it doesn't shake, F you. And it, he didn't retire, and uh, so forth and so on. These are one of his things. He's not a, he was not a cocky guy, but he basically wrote this poem. I'm not going to read it to you, cause, but he's basically saying you can stick your finger in water and you think you've got the thing conquered. You take it out, the water seeps out. You put water in your hand, it seeps out, and you're nobody. You're like a little piece of dust as far as the world goes. Uh, this is him at my first wedding with the belly dancer who outstaged the bride dancing. Uh, the Irish people call him Kelly, not Kalikian. Uh, Kerry is uncle, Paisum is another Armenian name, and I just call him dad. Uh, this is a shish kebab. Every Sunday we had shish kebab. That's a machine in our basement at the house on Ridge. It's a rotisserie, had some patient make it for him, and so forth. And, and his thing was he, was, he wanted to write and be, be a writer, but he realized at a young age that his wasn't gonna make it. Uh, I wanted to be a musician. I didn't, never was gonna make it. And he said, basically, you have to give up your first love and move on from that, uh, even though it's the love of your life. And uh, he gave up literature for medicine. Uh, he would sing in the OR, he played Armenian songs. One of his best friends was William Soroyan, the playwright. And uh, 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 William didn't say this, but my man, I guess you have to say a person that can't love a person now, but a man who can't love a woman can't be a good surgeon. Because you're saying you, you don't have any uh, empathy or uh, uh, passion. Uh, and that's Bill Soroyan, and he wrote all this stuff. Uh, he'd go out to Fresno and visit him and everything. My mother didn't like this guy. Thought he was a bad influence on my dad. Uh, there, there they are together with the handbook. And he'd always send Bill his short stories. He'd send them to him, what do you think, what do you think? He, years go by, he never answered him. He goes, we've been friends for 25 years. Let's just keep it that way. You're not a writer. It's not gonna happen, you know? Now, these are kind of, uh, he'd always tell me, stick with your own kind. He was upset I wasn't going to marry an Armenian. Uh, he was one for two in his marriages. Uh, both were Armenian. I was 0 for two. Neither was Armenian. So I don't know if that's enough power in that study. But he was, you know, he was all about Irish marries Irish, Jew marries Jew. I mean, I said, Dad, come on, it's America. You can't do that. Here he is with his first wife, who was an opera singer, but she didn't want to have kids. Came back from the war. He wanted kids. And he got rid of her for $50,000 back then. So, and, and she willed all her money to my dad, the story goes, and then she walks by Wesley Hospital here. I'm coming out of the hospital with my mother and father. I'm two days old. She ripped up the will at that point when she saw that he had a kid. So, whatever. So he goes to the old country, and that's his mom, that's his dad, that's my mother, that's my mother's brother who's married to my father's sister. So a brother and sister, uh, a brother and sister married a sister and brother. And uh, that's me with my mom and my little sister. I'm about two years old. And here I am picking my ear, not my nose. And then we have this one, Virginia. I'm about seven. I'm going to take a four minute break here. I'll tell you why in a second. That's Alice. She doesn't look too happy. She was supposed to be the doctor in the family, but she won every science fair in the state of Illinois until 18. And after six months in college, she said, I hate medicine. I'm going to be a history professor. She's a Brandeis. So she's a real doctor. I'm just an orthopedic surgeon. And this one's a, got an MBA. She works at the Children's Hospital in Boston. And Friday, two patients came to the office. One guy was, I don't know, about 90. He was my dad's banker. I couldn't believe it. I never see his patients anymore. Or most of them aren't here. And then uh, Plato came in. Plato, uh, I've seen him for years. I see you once a year, right? You came in Friday. Did, did Jimenez tell you to come in Friday to the office? This stuff, he came in once and he does an invitation. My dad looks a little, you're a little better looking than my dad. My dad looks a little like him. He's going to tell you a story for five minutes, and then he's going to do an invitation, and I'll cry. I'm going to sit down here. So come on up, please. So he's nice enough to take his Sunday and not go to church today. He's Greek. Uh, and uh, he's going to do his little shtick. I don't know what he's going to say. No idea. It's like a live patient. Uh, thank you for inviting me. The time is 1956. I was skiing in Aspen and um, injured my knee. 
Um, I arrived at the Northwestern Hospital, which was a memorial hospital, and uh, met his father. And he looked at me and he said, uh, Fufas, what did you bring me today? And I said, I don't know, uh, it's, uh, my, my, my knee is really bad. So he leaves and comes back with a hypodermic needle attached to a bicycle pump. And he said, I said, what are you doing? He said, so he sticks it in my knee and blows it up and I have a big air. <laughs> he sends me to the x-ray department. He reads the x-ray and he says, you see, the air separates the tissue so I can tell you you have a medial meniscus problem, of which he put me into a, a walking cast and said, you keep that there for 30 days, which he did, which I did. And after he removed the cast, I have skied, uh, played tennis, and I can, as you can see, I can still walk. And he was an absolutely amazing person. Not too long ago after that, I had a, a burning sensation in my, my, uh, my foot. And uh, I came to him, he said, Fulf, what brings you again? I said, well, I, I have Morton's neuroma. I said, how do you know? Here, let me take a look at it. He looks at it, and he looks up to me, he says, Fulfus, you have Morton's neuroma. He operated on that, and among other things, um, I seem to be having problems with my legs, my <laughs> hips, and we became very good friends. He shared with me his poetry, and um, I remember having breakfast. Uh, he had to be around five years old, so he doesn't remember me that and uh, I remember him again and said, um, he says, Fulfus, why do you bring me such trivia? I says, why can't you bring me a compound fracture? <laughs> and from that point on, he has taken care of me and took care of me, and now I'm in Armin's hand. Well, a year ago, I brought, I said, I think I broke my toe. I says, oh, let me look at it. He, he looks at me and he says, um, you didn't break your toe. You have uh, the gout. He says, I'm a surgeon. Go see your internist. And I said, here is a man that is a chip off his father's. And I've learned to appreciate the Kalikian family. I have to also... Um, share his poetry, and uh, he's in a, in, was an incredible individual. You, you'll never really know that. And I, I, again, thank you to share a few of these moments. It was great. It was not fun. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. So uh, when he came in the office, I immediately called my sisters and put them on the phone to do the imitation, and it, they, they were crying, too. You know, it, was, it was good stuff. And, that was, this was not planned. I, he said, uh, I said, will you come? And then I said, this morning, you mind talking? So this is, he'd go to Beirut. Every summer he went to Beirut because all uh, my grandparents emigrated there. And uh, he'd do free surgery. They'd line up uh, for two weeks. We'd stay there. He'd do all this free surgery. I'm trying to do that now. I go to Armenia. I don't want to go to Beirut. I don't want to be near there. But this is the house on Ridge Avenue. He wanted to be, he wasn't a Chicago cop. He wanted to be close to the hospital. My mother wanted to move to Winneka or Lake Forest, but he wouldn't let her. And we had this simple bungalow house on a quarter acre lot. That's me with my son, Armin. Uh, my mom's mad I didn't name him after my dad, but I couldn't give him that name in this country. It's kind of, you know, tough. It's hard enough, Armin's hard enough. But uh, that's the house. And this is the thing, my, when we'd fight over roast beef for uh, dinner, uh, every Sunday, uh, every uh, holiday we'd have roast beef, and his whole thing is the bone's the best part, grab that thing and bone it. So that's little Armin at age two. I don't know why that kid didn't show up. I'm pissed at him, but he's not here. But uh, uh, I'll give it to him private, the lecture. But uh, that's Armin at Bone 2 learning how to bone it. And that's my dad's basement where all the stuff happened. That's the workroom. Everything happened in there. The books, the poetry, everything. 
Now that's me in 57, I don't know where he's taking me then. That's me in 59, we went to the Seattle World Fair. That's me in 66, he actually took me to Amsterdam. It's a dirty story, I'm not gonna share it with you. A Couple of the people here know it. And I don't know what happened to me, but that's me in 69. And he's not pretty, he's not happy at all. But remember, I got a low draft number, I wanted to be a musician. I, I went to college, he never pressured me, but he's, you know, I could see how fulfilled he was in his life and happy. We're not talking the material stuff, he didn't like money, he wore nice suits so. though. But it, it was about the pleasure of his job and just life fulfillment, and these are stages of happiness. You know, the, the early greed stuff we do, you're happy with your job and, your, and then later your life in general and you wanna be happy with other people. Uh, he, did, he did admire women, especially bright women. He liked big eyes and big body parts. This is in Venezuela, I think I was on that trip. He's just being nice, but he was one of those, like the bear commercial, most interesting man in the world. He didn't want to come to my first met wedding because she wasn't Armenian, but my mother forced him. I had that porn pornographic mustache at the time. And uh, these were some of his quotes, never be known as an amputation surgeon, because if that's your reputation, nobody's gonna to come to you for your bunion, you know? Uh, his feeling on divorce, because he'd been through it, was when you have it and it's not working, just amputate it. It's like a malignancy, move on. He didn't do a lot of PDA, but he did here in this picture with my mom in San Francisco. Uh, if people were doing PDA, think it in, in public, you know, he it, it just thought it was phony. But that was him. That's him operating. Uh, this is a famous line of his, if Jesus can wash feet, I can do the prep too. Uh, there's a certain way you got to hold a knife. He did believe in arthroscopy when it came out. Uh, he was fearless of anything. I mean, the first total hip I did with him as a resident, he said, you want to see a sciatic nerve? I go, not really. He goes, watch. Psh. In three seconds, we're looking at the sciatic nerve. And it blades right on it. I mean, he loved anatomy. And uh, his OR was a little wild. We called it organized confusion. If you, the resident shook in the OR, his line was, two moving objects, what happens? One gets pregnant. So uh, this one, I'm still traumatized by this. One day, I'm doing an osteotomy with him. I'm second year resident, I'm doing a calc osteotomy on Mike Simon's tumor nurse, who she became later. And he says, pound the thing, pound it, are you a man or a mouse? Pound it, hit it like a man. You know, he's just torturing me. So I hit it, it went through the skin on the medial side, it went through the drape and into the sandbag. It was a real sandbag. I go, what do we do? He goes, wash her out and put her on her antibiotics. She'll be fine, she was fine. But <laughs> every time I do this osteotomy, I think of that moment. I just get a sweat, I torture the resident. Uh, that's Bill Kane, and I think that, well, the happiest day in his life was when I got into residency. Uh, and it was two years, it was fun. I had, Schaefer made me cover him on every case because he's 80 and something happened to the OR and I'm going, I don't want to cover him on every case. That's, bull, that's bullshit. Schaefer, why are you doing this to me? It's the best thing anyone ever did to me. Because in those two years, I learned all his little tricks and habits. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And uh, he said to me, uh, you know, when, he says, when I die, don't join a group. Be by yourself. If you join a group, you don't have testicles. Okay, so that went on for 14 years. Steve Kodros came along, and then I lost my testicles. Now, now our group got bought out, so now I'm just an employee, but we didn't, you know, that's the closest I came to joining a group, and it was fun. I'd stop by the house. That's Mike Tashin with him, uh, who's probably the most famous pediatric orthopedic surgeon ever lived. My father said he was a cheater and backgammon. Uh, that's the only sport he did besides swimming. So I'd bring girls home from college, you know, that girlfriend thing, He'd say, put on the record, pull up the rug, and he starts dancing with them, and they're loving it. I mean, he's a really good rumba dancer, samba, and my mother walks in like, what the hell is going on here? Like, and next thing you know, the girl's on his lap, you know? And he, he got away with so much stuff that uh, whatever, there he is dancing again. That's uh, my mother on the right, kind of disgusted, and my sister kind of drunk on his lap. This is Buddy Guy. He's saying, why am I showing this? And I'm not being racial here, I'm being honest with what he said. I was doing a courtship in New Orleans, and we went to Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Uh, Dennis, this is better than last night, though, by the way. This is good. So, he always said to me, American culture, other than the American Indians, if it wasn't for the African Americans, we wouldn't have any culture. He told me this in 1975. And it still sticks in my head about the jazz, blues, rock and roll, roots. Not, not country western necessarily. Uh, 
And uh, he said it's our real culture, a lot of the food, and, and he's right. And Thursday night, that was in my head again. I took this picture, and he loved this country. He thought it's a, he's not Donald Trump, but he thought it's the greatest country in the world and still would. I couldn't vote for Trump because now my, my dad's not uh, from one of those six countries, but you know, I just thought if that was a real law, I don't think he'd be here today. I wouldn't be here today, you know? So whatever. So what about the Armenian stuff? I'm gonna wrap it up. This is Bostrom on secured meat. Makes you smell like hell. You can only have it on a Friday night. Can't go to work otherwise. Uh, uh, tartar, which is raw meat. Uh, pacha is tripe. Uh, Bugler is cracked wheat. Uh, Tan is a yogurt drink. Uh, the only cheese he liked is blue because it had penicillin in it. Cashews and walnuts and barbecue shish kebab was a big deal. Uh, he was a real renaissance man. He knew music, dance. He wrote a lot of short stories. Every story had a sexual connotation, though, every one. It was good stuff. Uh, his favorite book was Philip, Portnoy's, uh, Philip Roth's Portnoy's Complaints, a little dirty. And then this is a very good book. He made me read it in high school or college, 40 Days of Musadag. It's about the Armenians that wouldn't leave Armenia, that stayed on a mountain and fought back and beat a, a little battle, beat the uh, Turks. But it's a pretty riveting book. Promise is based on this, the movie. Uh, and these are some of his short stories. I, I've read them. Uh, he did a lot of literature at Sayatnova, a famous poet. Uh, and, and, and this is his feeling about literature. It doesn't directly mimic life. It's very subtle, you have to watch what you read. This is a little short poem he wrote, and so forth. So now, then he gets, they didn't wear lead in the OR, they didn't correct their thyroid, so he got terminal thyroid cancer in about 81, and he got every complication you could think of. He had to have a trach. Oh, they told him they have radiotherapy, but he found someone that wanted to operate on him. He didn't believe in radiation treatment. He was a surgeon, he wanted to cut out. And there he is with Dr. Serafian on the left and Dr. Dumanian, the cardiac surgeon on the right. And that's with one of our popes giving him an award. And even till the moment he died in the hospital room, he's writing that book. He's just pushing and pushing and pushing, wouldn't give up uh, one bit. That's his uh, gravesite in Skokie. And that's why I joined North Shore, because it's right next to there. I can go visit him more. And he's got a plot there for me, too. <laughs> and there's an endowment at the uh, Northwestern. I don't know where the money goes. I know it's there. Uh, there's an OR that they're dedicating. I'm going to go there in September and take my two daughters. Uh, they're dedicating an OR to him in a small hospital in Yerevan. And uh, these are, we have a teacher every year at Northwestern that mimics what he does. Uh, this is over the last few years. There's Mickey up there. Uh, and, you know, he's a teacher, scientist, author, mentor, and everything else. Now, the real story is, can I pass anything on? I don't know. That's my two daughters at Jazz Fest in New Orleans. That's me on the top with Armin now. He's taller than me, thank God. But he's got, I know he's my son, because look at those knees. The Varus, he's got my Varus, I know he's mine. The other one, Costa, I, I, he, I know he's my son too, but man, he's taller than anybody, and uh, you know, he's, well, he's, he's half Greek, so he's a good looking kid. So the girls aren't gonna go into medicine. Uh, I'm, it's not for my ego, I'm doing it for his ego. My dream is one of them decides to go into the best field in the world, orthopedic surgery. And if I can pass anything on to him, I'm not gonna pressure these kids at all, and I'm just gonna try to be a good role model example for him. I think we all should do that. Thank you, Matt, and everybody for the opportunity and doing this talk, thanks.